Welcome back, everyone. To Security Weekly, we're here with Seth Geftik, who is a senior manager in the Advanced Security Operations Center Solution Product Marketing Group at RSA. That's a mouthful. Seth's an industry expert in the fields of cybercrime, breach detection, incident response, and cyber threats, and spent over five years in RSA's fraud and risk intelligence group, cyber. That means drink three, three times. Seth, <laughs> welcome to the drinks, show. So I can't do that yet. Thanks okay. for having me. I made sure my bio would get, get as many shots for you guys. That's as right. Possible. Yeah, as much possible. cyber in there as possible. ASOC. Uh, so, Seth, how did you get your start in information security? Uh, so, like, a, I think a lot of people uh, in the industry, I kind of lucked into it. So, before I worked at RSA, I worked at a tech giant, AOL. Mm. And AOL, we sold security products. So, when you, uh, when you got your AOL account hacked, you'd call up the help desk and they would sell you an RSA token. Um, so, from there, a bunch of people from AOL moved over to RSA. And uh, as soon as I moved over to RSA, the FFIC regulations went into play and all the banks in the United States and eventually a lot of them in the world went from relying just on username and password to having some form of two-factor authentication, so risk-based authentication. So, uh, you know, we went from you know, not really having much expertise to really diving deep into that world. So for me, it was really exciting. You know, the, the security industry is filled with a lot of fascinating characters, big problems, um, and, you know, I fell in love with it. So I've been at RSA for the last 10 years almost. Nice. Seth, so what advice do you have for security professionals that speak Klingon to their C-level executives? Well, start with speaking English. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> It helps. I, I, I think that there is – you've seen this a lot in the, the security industry is that you have people who are really, really smart – and our technical security experts. And you often get these conversations going, and I've, I've been witness to a lot of them where someone will start answering a question or throwing out an objection, or trying to start a conversation, and they're really speaking, you know, theoretically different languages. So the, the technical speak, while really helpful, um, there's so many people in the room that need to be part of the decision and part of the conversation, really have no idea what they're talking about. Um, I'm sure, there's plenty of people who will watch you know, this podcast, will hear you guys talking about something when you're you know, talking about a vulnerability, and it'll go right over their head. That's fine in something like this because you're, you're here to learn. But when you're in a conversation in your own organization trying to learn how to protect it, uh, having that communication channel be clear is really important. So I was in a, a meeting uh, recently where yeah I love the story because I've been there, dude. Yeah. Yeah. So so you know as a as a vendor we have the advantage of getting to meet a lot of people out there and a lot of a lot of security professionals, and you know it was a kind of a EBC we call them you know one of the general meetings where we talk about different technologies and different services, and uh, the CISO was talking about uh, a problem and you know we were working it out with them. Um, one of the, the tech guys in the room, we, we usually refer to these guys as the rock stars, you know, the, the people who actually use our products, the, the security analysts, the guys who sit in the sock or the circ all day, running, um, running the technology, had some sort of objection. No, so, um, you know, you know we, we sorted out the objection pretty quickly. It wasn't that big of a deal. But you could tell that the, the CISO in the room had absolutely no idea what this, uh, this rock star was talking about. It went completely over his head. And you see that more often than not. So the, the CISO just didn't have the, the guts to say, I have no idea what you're talking about right now because they didn't want to look silly in front of us, in front of their coworkers. Um, but I think we need to get past the point where we're afraid to ask questions and show fear of not understanding something because the, the one thing you learn the longer you're in this industry is that you don't know everything and there's always something – that you have new, uh, new to learn, that new to understand. And if you don't ask questions, you're not going to really progress. Um, so part of it is is framing your questions and answers in a way that that really will resonate with other people. And I think it's a problem not just for the technical folks to like the C level, the CISO folks, but even at the CISO level, you know, they're often just seen as the security guy, or the security gal at their company, and they can't speak. Uh, you know, the language of business, if you will, so that the other people in the C-suite and the executives, you know, understand why, uh, why their opinion matters and, and not just speak purely in security terms. Or terms I, I have to ask Matt all the time how to translate what he says all the time. I'm like, what, say that in English again? Dude, what was that? Yeah, we use too many TLAs. <laughs> too many, yes, exactly. <laughs> SLAs and TLAs and 
perpetual annual subscription, all in the same sentence. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, back up again. Hold on. Now you're, now you're speaking my language. I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about now. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, so you wrote another article, Seth, about um, along the lines of like what we can do to take advantage of the newfound popularity of hacking that we've seen. And this is certainly timely. I think even since you wrote that article, there have been new shows and new movies about uh, hack. Well, I shouldn't say they're about hacking. They're about hacking with like air quotes, like Scorpion and CSI Cyber, which and Black Hat the movie. And, and Black Hat the movie. I, it's just I haven't seen Black Hat the movie yet, but I have watched painfully, very painfully. It's almost to the point where I watched Scorpion and it's. It's not enjoyable. In the beginning, I was like, ha, 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 I can point out the inaccuracies, but it's so horrible now. It's almost, it's unwatchable. CSI Cyber, I think, is more watchable, um, but still, like, funny for us because it's kind of bad. So, but what can we do to take advantage of these, these this kind of newfound popularity that we have? Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote a blog on the RSA uh, blog site, and it was about being a security hipster. So we're at a point where, you know, those of us that have been in the industry a long time, when you join the industry, you're enjoying it because you were some sort of geek that loved doing this stuff. And, you know, that was your, your hobby and somehow it became your profession. Or you were like me and, you know, somehow lucked into the industry. But now we're at a point where people will actually join us because they think it's a good career opportunity and they can make money at it, which I don't think five years ago, that was the advice people were doling out. Um, you know, when I interviewed at RSA 10 years ago, the, you know, the hardest hitting question I got was, do you know what a phishing attack is? You know, you fast forward today and the president of the United States is talking about cyber issues. Um, so it's crazy to see how far we've gone. Um, so, so the article, the blog I wrote was uh, focused on this idea that security has officially gone mainstream. And I know that it's going to rub people the wrong way and they're not going to like it, but it's, it's already happened. And, you know, it's it's already reached the point where, you know, you're not going to be able to put the genie back in the bottle. And so you're going to get salespeople, you're going to get CISOs, you know, just at, people talking about security who don't really have an informed opinion. You know, maybe they're writers for CSI Cyber. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> just, just this morning, I was watching my local news station and they were talking about Apple Pay and, you know, the chance of it getting hacked and things like that on the local news. Like it, it wasn't exactly a. Uh, you know, hard hitting news story, but the fact that this stuff is coming up and you either can have the opinion that this is bad and, and try to creep into your quarter and just focus on your world. But it's actually a real huge opportunity for us because those of us in the industry long enough know that security is a real issue that really matters. And most likely if you've been around for a while, you have a passion for it, you know, not just for the security itself, but the fact that you know, security does influence the world. And the rest of the world has picked up on this fact and is actually starting to realize the power and the influence that it has. So it's getting these people on board and being the catalyst to be a, a leader to them, say, no, let me explain the issues to you. Let me say why this matters, or why this is a bad idea, or how many times we've gone down this route before, you know, whether it be talking about encryption standards and exportation of encryption governments, whether it be about vulnerabilities, whether it be about uh, you know, building the Internet of Things and understanding that security has to be built into that process as early as possible, otherwise you have problems down the road, that the people in our industry have been experts for a while and they need to have their voices heard, you know, because we have a lot of passion. We have a, you know, certainly a lot of people in our industry that are passionate about security and they need to preach that so that, that we're the ones that, that, you know, the people that are new to it are listening to and not, uh, you know, pundits who are just out because it's the new hip trend, right. if you will. Now, Matt, I was told right before the show that you, you and uh, Seth know each other. Yeah. From you guys, you guys work together. Yeah. Right? We were both in the Excellent. product. Well, the strategy yeah. team for Archer yeah. ended up rolling up under product marketing. So yeah, Seth and I did. So do you have questions? Together. Questions for Seth, knowing his background, but not yet. Not, but not yet. Okay. So feel free to chime in. I thought it was interesting that you guys had some history together. Um, so, uh, Seth, what are some of the latest trends in threat research? It's kind of a general, you know, question. But you know, to talk about what you what you're kind of seeing in terms of uh, threat research and how it's helping organizations. Well, there's certainly a trend to not just go after, not just go research to find specific vulnerabilities or threats, but actually follow threat actors themselves. So, you know, there's been a huge shift at the last couple of years 
in people willingly talking about attribution, which never happened before, people wanting to find threat actor groups so they could name that group and you know do a study on them, um, which obviously there's there's the incentive of when you know your enemy, then you have a better chance of actually you know defending against their tactics. And then there's also the the motive that a lot of threat research now people do because it gets press and it gets mm. you know it gets hits. It used to do, be. Do you think that really helps organizations? We've kind of been on the fence about that on the show, like whether or not knowing the threat actors and some of their motives. Like, how do you apply that to your hardcore operational security? I mean, I, I think it's hard to argue that attribution wouldn't help, right? But whether it's you know the top three things you should be doing is worrying about the the people who are attacking you or not, I, you know, personally, I think, yeah, that's great to know, but we have so many other problems to tackle mm. before we get into the specifics of who is the attacker. Um, you know, I think at a, if, you, if you're in a, a board level and, and you walk in and you say, we just got breached, one of the first questions they're going to ask is who, who did this, right? But if you go into a SOC and say, hey, we just got an alert, we have a real problem here, the first question they're not going to ask is who's attacking us. They're going to say, what are they after? What are their techniques? What's going on here? Um, you know, first they have to have the visibility into what's going on and then have the ability to actually analyze the attack. I think they're, you know, they're happy to know who's doing it eventually, but, you know, I think that's in some ways more interesting to non-security folks than it is to use as real security value. I'm not, I'm not dismissing it. I just don't think it's like top so, three. So Seth, I think it's more about the tools, the tactics, and the processes that they're using, not necessarily who's doing it, because if I want to... If I want to understand the attack and what's going on, it's probably a little more important to understand what they're doing and how they're doing it so I can identify others, not necessarily who, because it could be used by multiple. So identifying one group mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily help you in, 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 in no. researching the attack, right? I mean, unless that group has some very specific technique that is unique to them that you, you'd be looking at specifically. But you're right, generally it's about the techniques the attackers are doing and your ability to spot those you know, IOCs rather than figure out who's behind the IOC because a lot of the attacks look the same anyway, right? So the one thing we learned from Sony is attribution is difficult. Yeah, right? absolutely. Very difficult. Um, so uh, how can you take some of that threat research about the how, right, and apply that into your organization? Like, are there specific examples you can give of that? Sure. I mean, I think, I think when you look at the type of techniques hackers use or, or um, attackers use, uh, there, there are specifics that you want to know um, that, you know, your technology might have visibility into, but it's not just going to be an out of the box, like plug the technology in and says, okay, I know every time there is an attack. So looking at things like unusual traffic over non-standard ports, and that's something you're always going to want to look at. Looking for, you know, executables that have been, um, packaged up, right? So zip file with executable, executable content in there. Those are types of things that you're going to want to lo look at constantly. They're not always indicators of an attack. But these are the things that are unusual, uh, like beaconing traffic, when you have a large spikes of traffic going out. When you have that going out to a blacklisted country or, or an unusual destination, you know, that, that destination might change every time. You know, a, an attacker might send the data to Eastern Europe, they might send it to Asia, they might send it to North America. So you can't just write a rule that says all traffic to, you know, to Canada is bad. Um, but always be looking for those types of anomalies. So part of it is knowing what the, the normal is, what's good traffic, what's good in your organization, and then looking for those types of techniques and, and, and then having the ability once you say, okay, this is an alert, this looks unusual, how can I actually dive into it um, both from a technology pr uh, perspective, do I have the technology to actually see further, and do I have the people who know what, I'm look, what to look for? Yeah, it's interesting. We've had a previous guest talk about how to look for some of those things and some of the things you can look for in your logs. And it's interesting how they're they state that they're more effective than running some of the endpoint protection technologies. They're like, I, I know what to look for that most malware uses. And when I do that, I'm somewhat more effective than some of my endpoint protection because I know what to look for in my environment. Is that is that something you see as well? Yeah, and the, the word we use most often is visibility, right? So logs are you know important, but they're just one piece of the puzzle. You also need network visibility, looking into flows, looking into packets. You need visibility of what's happening on your endpoints. Um, so whether you know 
the protection tools you have are good, but we know they're not that effective. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having breaches. So if you look at, if you read like Verizon data breach investigation report, and they look at the number of cyber espionage breaches that, that were detected, only 1% of those were ever detected by logs. The rest of them are coming from external parties or, in some cases, just you know, random chance. Now, now, now that you bring Verizon's report, one question around it, one of the things that's also mentioned in the report is that when they went back, the evidence was there. The evidence was in the logs. The evidence was in the tools that they had. Why do you think it is so difficult to get... Uh, people have the tools. They have them. The, the problems, we have known about them now for years and years. Uh, why do you think we keep going in this vicious cycle of people not using what they have or not knowing how to use what they have, not spending the time to look into all of that? Um, I, I remember when I used to work at another, at another multinational company, one of the things that I kept pestering sales and my customers about was you just bought $50,000, $100,000, $200,000 in equipment, but you bought zero training. You bought zero services on helping you set up this stuff, but here's a check mark that you're going and checking it out. How can we improve the way that these organizations are operating? and break that cycle because the, the evidence is there. It's in their logs. Many of them actually had some of the best security tools that were out there, but they were not looking at it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not just a simple, oh, you do this and then your problem solved. Uh, I mean, the cliche is what people process technology and, and all of that matters. So, you know, you might have the evidence in your logs, but you also had a thousand false alarms that you had to look at too and a team of three people just doesn't have the ability to do it when you read the verizon report you'll see that the attackers are getting faster and faster so their ability to compromise your system um, is they're getting better at it but our speed of detection has remained flat over the last decade um, so having the evidence somewhere in a log is great but if it's not at your fingertips and ease and instantly um, telling you something, something with more context than just what's in the log, you're probably going to miss it. So the reason they went back and looked through their logs is because they know something bad already happened after the fact. Um, so part of it is having technology that has not just the visibility, but also the speed to react quickly. Part of it is having a team of people that know what to look for. And that's something that you can only do with uh, training and expertise over time. I mean, We'd all love to have security tools that you plug in and it just you're instantly safe. But you know, I don't think any vendor, any vendor who's claiming that is is you know, is not telling the truth because you need really good people to run security tools. Um, you know, the vendor's job is to make the tools easier to use and 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 have better usability. But uh, the the security teams themselves need to constantly be training. They need to be kept on up and thread intel. They need to make sure that they're they're at the forefront of what they need to do. And I think the small organizations struggle the most. They're, they're the ones looking to outsource a lot of this work to MSSPs and, and providers who can help run it. So, uh, Seth, um, um, will you be speaking at RSA this year? Or I know you've done some podcasts and, and blogging uh, along those lines, but... I will not be speaking at RSA conference. Um, I will be there for sure. I'll be hanging around by the booth, going to other people's sessions. So I'll have a busy week, but uh, less pressure on me because I am not, I'm not speaking it. Nice. Uh, nice. So. Now, Seth, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? I'm ready. Three words to describe yourself. Let's go with clever, obviously, uh, logical, and adaptable. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Um, I would be a subcontractor. I would, I would hire that out. So I would hire someone else to do the serial killing for me, like Martin Blank style, gross point blank. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? I was so much older then. I'm much younger than that now. It's a Bob Dylan quote. In the, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? It's all about the first mover advantage. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Judd Apatow and Tina Fey. Nice. I like the Tina Fey. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> nice choice. Seth, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. Had a great time. Thank really you. It. Thanks, guys. 
With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and interview Mr. Alderman coming up next. So stay tuned. Matt's now heard two different people answer the five questions, so I'm, I'm waiting in anticipation to see how Matt... cleverness. Yes. Matt's, <laughs> Matt, Matt is, is prepared, hopefully, for that, and we're going to see how he answers those My coming up next. My clever adaptiveness. That's right. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. 